is just a huge, huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing my classmate, Bradley Howard Gettleman. Uh, he used to always go by Bradley Howard Gettleman until I uh, until he met me. Then he said, I'll, I'll never use the Howard part again. And he refused to tell anybody that's his middle name. Dr. Gettleman earned his degree from the University of Missouri in Kansas City. He finished his master's degree in endodontic residency at the University of Minnesota. He has published numerous articles on endodontic therapy, and I hope someday makes us an online C course on Dental Town. <laughs> he is a member of the West Side Dental Study Club, past president, American Dental Association, American Association of Endodontists, where he just completed tenure as chairman of the Professional Standards Peer Review and Ethics Committee, Arizona Endodontic Association, past president, and the Arizona State Dental Association. He is a diplomat of the American Board of Endodontics and has been in private practice since 1989. And you remember a while back, we had um, Stephen Cohen on, and Brad actually um, wrote Chapter 8. There it is, Bradley Co Howard Co Gettleman, co-wrote with Robert Rhoda, a dentist up the street here too, uh, on the non-surgical retreatment. And it is just, uh, I, I got to tell you the, the, the inside story on Brad. So he was Gettleman, I was Ferran. So four years at UMKC Dental School, we sat usually about this far apart. And I swear to God, if the, if the instructor said in lab that we had to prep some extracted tooth or some, what were those typing on teeth? It's bone eye teeth. If we, if, we had to, if we had to buy one of those and do a crown, Brad would do 30. I mean, it, all I remember is that when I got to the lab, you're already there. When I left the lab, you were still there. I don't think there was a more disciplined son of a God in the class of 87 than you. I mean, you were just, you were always this one. Is that from your roots as a wrestler here? And I'm not sure. But you I'm were, sure you, you, because of that, but you are, is. you are, you seriously were, are one of the most disciplined people I remember in my life. I mean, you, you, you did everything. Thank you. Serious. And, 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 and I knew another great end on us. Um, when I was a great undergrad, I was in room 915 and, and in 919 was Joe Dubkin who was one of the most um, intense or ended on us too. It was, uh, the difference between Joe and I is Joe probably just had to do it one time. He's a little brighter. I, I think I did it over and over again just to get it right. <laughs> and uh, my gosh. Uh, so um, you and I were having a discussion and not to throw anybody a bridge, but we were having a discussion that it seems like 30 years ago, uh, UMKC, how many, how many ended on us were in our class? How many ended on us taught at UMKC when we were there? I would say there's six full-time endodontists, if I remember correctly, I could possibly name them. There was, on any half day in clinic, probably two part-timers that worked full-time private practice and volunteered, or, you know, came half day for the clinic. So you had six full-time, maybe 10 part-time. Who was your favorite? Ramona Geary. Really? Mine was Bambi Duro and Tubby. Both real good guys. I have not committed to communicate with Bambi Duro. I still have a relationship with Ramon. Speak with him from time to time. Ramon what? Aguirre. He's up in the University of Minnesota. How do you guys spell Aguirre? A-G-U-I-R-E. A-G-U-I-R-E? A-R-R-E. He, uh, so he and now, his brother both ended on us in Minneapolis. He, so, he was, he, when we graduated in 87, he moved up to Minnesota. That's where he did his residency in ended on us. He's from Mexico City. Um, he moved up there, so he was teaching part time up there. So I could kind of continue to work together. He's part time up there in private practice. He's not teaching anymore. He's full time private practice. And his younger brothers ended on us that went through Minnesota. But he went to Minnesota and came back down to UMKC to get his American DDS and then went back up there. Same so, with Babby Durr did, I believe. So we went to a public school, University of Missouri, Kansas City. Correct. Now there's private schools. Um, Many. And there's there's uh, two of them in our city. We're we're in, uh, both in Phoenix. You're in Glendale. I practice in Glendale. But you live in Phoenix. Correct. Glendale but, is just a western. But but Phoenix. Phoenix Phoenix has you know lots of suburbs, and one of them has uh, AT Steel in Mesa, and one of them has Midwestern in, uh, in, in Glendale. Glendale. Right down from my How many endodontist faculty would you say are at Midwestern? There's one full time, and I heard just this week they hired a second. I just heard that they hired. Okay, but the schools the schools five years old. 
or more. Or more. They probably had five graduating in that range. But for, for, the, for the most part, since they've opened, how many endodontists are on the floor? There was one full time, and I, I believe they just hired one. I don't know if you started yet or not. I heard that yeah. with the grapevine. Just, so, just so I, I guess where I'm getting at with this, it, it seems like when you talk to recent graduates, I mean, it depends on the school, depends on the country. But would you say that a lot of kids are graduating with very minimal endodontic understandings? It's hard for me to say because I'm not in academics right now. I plan on going into academics at some time. Um, so Brad, it, Brad, it, it's, Brad, it's Brad, real I, hard I for me kids, to say. I, I meet kids who graduate from dental school, five hundred thousand dollars in debt, and never did a molar root canal. Then they're definitely undereducated. They they did like two single canal teeth. Then I would consider that undereducated. I'm you know I'd have to go school by school to see what the right, requirements right, right. are, what their experiences are. Um, but I just know what we went through, what we had in the University of Missouri, Kansas City. I know what was going on at the University of Minnesota when I was there. And I'm not sure how many are there now, but it's uh, education is, is maybe different than when, when we went through. Not to say it's better or it's worse, but I think it's some schools is different. I, I know yeah. that. I know that. But what would you say in general? What, how do you feel in general about the state of endodontic? Um, the state of endodontic education and the state of endodontics has performed in I, It seems like some of the younger practitioners that come out that I work with did not have the education that, that, that we had and the experience. Um, you know, we were fortunate enough to go to dental school that was in a, located where there was a, a ton of patients. Right. Patients was not an issue. I think some of these newer dental schools have been placed in locations or nice areas where that's not the population they're going to serve. So I think patient population is an issue. Um, and based on that, patient populations, you need a certain number of educators based on the educator to student ratio. Yeah, I, K, don't, I don't know what the ideal education KU, ratio uh, is. KU Med School um, realized that having a medical university in downtown Lawrence, Kansas is, I mean, there's only 30,000 people and it's a college town. So they, they moved the last two years downtown Wichita. Because when kids ask me, you know, what do you think of this residency or that residency? I say the only thing that matters in a residency is that you're in in the poorest part of the biggest city in the you get world. Experience. You get experience. Yeah, that way you'll see the most diseases walking into your clinic. You go to the richest part, they're going to go to private doctors. You're not going to have the patient population to get the education. Yeah, so just, just find the biggest, poorest ghetto residency you can find, and you'll see one of everything. And get the experience. Yeah. To be a private practitioner. So I think, um, I think, that, I think that's an issue. We we read this book in dental school 30 years ago. How does it feel to that uh, 30 years after you graduate, you're writing chapter 8 of the same book we used in dental school? It's uh, rewarding. A lot of work. Oh, I, I mean, myself and Rob Rowe did the last three editions. We were able to do the 9th, 10th, and they asked us back to the 11th. Are we going to do it again? I doubt it. It's a lot of work. So it's you wrote, nice, you wrote in the 9th? What, what edition did we have in dental school? We had, I believe, the 4th. Really? I think it was the fourth. Huh. I should ask you. Good thing about Pathways Pulp is the most translated textbook in the world on endodontic therapy from the last I heard. Yeah. So that's good. And they do, the problem with textbooks versus literature versus the internet is before it gets into ink, some of the information can be sure. kind of old. So they continue to get new editions very regularly, which is good because people still like textbooks, not use as much as. as when we were in school, because obviously you're getting online, you're looking things up, it's quicker, more efficient, it's also more present up to date. Um, but I like having a hard copy to look at just because I get bored. And I've been able to get my hands on every edition um, with the exception of the first. You don't have the first? I can't get I'm trying to get it on somewhere online. You can't find it on eBay? I, I searched for it and, and I may have found one this morning to just, just to compare it. It's just kind of fun. Yeah. I'm a nerd. I like to read things. Well, you know, speaking and of things that, change. Things change speaking regularly. Of that, I bought. Um, I bought on when eBay came out, when it first came out, I think that, what was that, like 94 or something? I found the first three books autographed and signed by G.B. Black. And oh, really? Them. Yeah, and I, I have them, they're here in the house. Very cool. And um, it was so amazing because- I'll autograph this for you. Because uh, um, I do want you to- I'm just joking. Um, I'm just joking. I, I thought it was interesting because, you know, they, um, you know, we know what we know, we know what we don't know, um, no, we, we, don't, have we don't know. We don't, knowns. We, we don't know. What we don't know. I think that's a problem. You talk about young dentists and education. I think that's a that's a key phrase. They don't know what they don't know. So I'll disagree with you. We don't, and that's the biggest problem with young dentists. 
You don't know what you don't know until you learn it. Then you realize, I didn't know that. I mean, how can you say you don't know what you don't know? Make sense? Well, I was quoting the, uh, who, who's that guy in the, um, oh, who was, um, who was, it, it was someone in the Bush administration, Bush 43. He said there are known knowns. Those okay. are the things we know. There are known unknowns. Okay. Like, like dark think, matter. Think we don't know. We don't know a lot. Okay. Don't know. okay. And then there sense. are unknown knowns. Don't know what we don't know. And then there are unknown unknowns. That's interesting. Okay. And, yeah, and the, the point I was going with that is when I read, um, um, I don't have Pierre Fichard's book. He was the first test yeah, 200 years ago. But that stuff was just almost silly. And then G.V. Black's, 100 years ago, the father of modern dentistry for the United States. I mean, he, I mean, they were trephinating above the teeth to let the evil spirits out. And then they drew the pictures of the evil spirits. And they all looked like uh, king's jesters with little bells on their feet. And so I'm wondering, 100 years from now, how much of this will look like evil spirits with, with... Interesting. Let, let me let me go back a hundred years. Can I go back a hundred yeah. years? Yeah. Do you know Ben Johnson? Yeah, the founder of Thurman Phil in Tulsa. Yeah, brilliant guy, great guy. Found <clears throat> a movie in their basement years ago, and he paid to have this put on video cassette of a doctor, M. L. Ryan, I think it's R. H. E. I. N. Doing endodontic therapy in 1917, a hundred years ago, and he was he gave me this. I had this. On a video, I have this on my laptop, and I'll you show do? it. I have a copy of this. Ben Johnson. Can I have? Can I have a, a copy? A extremely generous. I'd have to get permission. Ben, he gave it to me. Extremely generous man. He won't have a problem with that. It's the coolest thing that I've seen in endodontic therapy. Can I show it when I lecture it wherever I, I go? I do still the lecture. Let's put it at the end. Let's ask but, Ben if we can put it at the end of the uh, but podcast. But I, uh, I can. I'll ask Ben, and I have a copy. I don't have one with me here, but I'll get it to you. There's a, Tell Ben. There's an eight-minute eight version. Ben there's, might not remember, but in we got out in 1987, and when I heard of him first time, I called him from my office. And I'm asking Ben, and you know what that son of a gun said to me? What? He goes, he goes, you just asked me nine questions in like two minutes. He goes, uh, just fly down here and spend the day with me. So I flew down to Tulsa, Oklahoma. He's a great guy. Stayed with him all day, and then I said, God, I wish I had stayed another day, and he goes, uh, he goes, we'll do it. He goes, nah, I gotta get a hotel and all that stuff. And he said, stay at my place. He came out here to visit you once, because I had yeah. dinner with him. He said, we had dinner, my wife and I had dinner with him. Shortly after he saw you, like the next day, he stayed in town, and he was telling yeah. me, I said, yeah, I actually know Howard pretty well. We went to dental school together, and he's a great guy. But anyway, he gave me this video of M.L. Ryan, and let me tell you, tell you about it. I'll show you the video. I think I have a long version, like an eight-minute version. Number one, they're using a rubber dam. Canterbury frame, the old wraparound. You've seen those little straps around the head that pulls it back. Yeah. So they were using rubber dam, which I get cases that have been started by general dentists in my office. I put a rubber dam, and they go, what the heck is that? I mean, that's rule number one. I do a lot of expert witness work just defending dentists. And I can tell you what, right now, if there's no rubber dam on, it's undefensible. If nothing happens, you know, but... If, if you don't get caught, like running a stop sign if nobody sees you, but the success rate goes down, you get all sorts of contamination, saliva and junk in the canal. It's, it's, it's very, very dangerous, potential aspirating a file. It's, it's, it's malpractice. You don't use, you don't get caught, use it. It's malpractice. I cannot defend a practitioner, will not defend a practitioner who does a case without a rubber dam. Period, end of story. What if they use 1917, 100 years ago, this video, they're using a rubber dam. It has a Canterbury frame. We haven't seen one of those in a long time, but they're using a rubber dam with very similar rubber dam clamps that we use today. Good isolation. I mean, it's it's beautiful. And the guy does a great job treating the canal. Now they do some ionization, and the guy's got this welder, and, and the, and, but they're using sodium hypochlorite. They use Johnson Johnson paper points. What, last time you dried a canal, what'd you use? Johnson Johnson. Johnson paper points. This is, and it says Johnson in, in 2000, and I'm sorry, 1917. They're using bichloride solution. What is that? Sodium hypochlorite. It's an unbelievable video. And it's, it's, what's scary is how similar. Now, they're using hand files. They didn't have finger files. There, there's no nickel titanium. They're using chloroperca technique. The Johnson Callahan method, and they condensing it, and they get little, the old Boston pie, little puffs. They, they do a real nice job. But they spent a lot of time cleaning and shaping the canal. The key to endodontic therapy, cleaning and shaping it under rubber dam isolation. And they did a great job of operation. It's unbelievable. 
hundred years ago, nineteen seventeen. I will get you a copy of the video. And do you, you call him? Do you call Ben or you email him or what's he go by these days? I, I, I see him from time. I'll get in touch with him. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that won't be an issue. Yeah. Tell him I want to podcast him too. He's a great guy, brilliant yeah. guy. And um, and he reminds me a lot of uh, um, who's the guy from Chattanooga, Tennessee, McSpadden. McSpadden, John, John McSpadden. Yeah. Who uh, I think when who told me that he. Um, was the most interested in rotary because he's like six six and had hands the size of a bear, and well, he, one of the first rotary instruments was a McSpadden compactor. Yeah, you know, kind of thermal plasticized. We got a perch and condensing it down the canal. So one of the first rotary instruments we put in a canal. Now that was stainless steel. Is like a reverse threaded head drum, but McSpadden compactor. I don't know if you know. Have seen yeah, those absolutely. Not. And and um, we did a podcast with him, um, the film at Dentaltown, and. Um, have you, uh, I mean, if you, if you put your hand on him, you, you look like you're either a newborn baby or he's a gorilla. It's like shaking hands with a catcher's mitt. <laughs> he said, he said, I, I, I had to do that. I mean, look at my hand. I mean, he's a moose of a man. He's a big guy. Just a big guy and big hands. Um, but, um, so what do you, so back to the, there are no knowns. Those are things that we know you say yeah. you got to wear a rubber band. Um, but you say these young kids, they're, they're known unknowns that they, they don't even know what they don't. So they, exactly. they have unknown knowns. What, what, what which, you, is, what, which I think could be dangerous. That could be related to education, possibly. And Maybe, maybe they're taught well, they didn't pay attention, they didn't study, they didn't follow. Who and knows, the, who knows the, the podcasters are, um, they're all 30 and under. So we're, we're talking to millennials. Almost, almost all the evidence yeah. we have Makes is sense. they're millennials from Kansas to Kathmandu. Um, I mean, the distribution of these things listened to in China and Iran, and but they're all under 30. And because people our age, we're either we're usually in a nursing home reading textbooks, and so they're all on uh, iTunes on their smartphone. What do you tell them? What do you think they're too young to know, and that they won't know that they'll know after they've done a thousand molars over three decades? I'll keep it simple. How many molars have you done? I'll keep it. Oh, good God. I don't know how many tens of thousands of us. I, mean, I, I have, okay, I have, so so I this no, guy's no, done no, ten thousand no, more. I, I have no. I've been practicing full time twenty eight years. Yeah, I'm. I'm twenty eight. Twenty eight years. Oh, because okay, cause I'm two, thirty because I didn't go to. Special but I had two years of residency. Okay. So I'm twenty eight out from residency. So I'm two years ahead of you then. That's what you're in, saying. In private practice, you're right. <laughs> you know yeah. what? I'll keep it simple, and because you spend so much time on instrumentation of a canal and arbitration of a canal, that's what we talk about. When, you, when you, you ask somebody, how do you do endodontic therapy? How do they answer? Probably in an arbitration method. Well, I know. If you ask somebody, how do you do endodontic therapy? They're gonna say, I do vertical condensation, warm gutta percha. I do thermophil, I do that. Obturation of the root canal system is probably 5% of your time put in. Would you agree with that? Yeah, it's not what you put in, it's what you take out. Correct. And people say, but they answer in an alteration technique. Would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. And I always get frustrated with that because, and people say, what's the most important thing? I say, the most important part of the endodontic procedure is whatever you do at that time. Diagnosis is the first thing. If you make a wrong diagnosis, who cares how well you follow that curve if it's the wrong darn tooth, <laughs> right? Proper anesthetic after the proper diagnosis. Who cares if you didn't anesthetize the patient properly and they feel everything you do, you give them a miserable experience. Then proper isolation, proper access, so proper so on and so forth. So to keep it simple, what would I tell a young dentist? Learn how to diagnose pulpal and periodicular disease and understand, that's from a diagnostic standpoint, that's the most important thing, understand pulpal diagnosis, periodicular diagnosis, and the other thing regarding actual instrumentation or the mechanical aspect of the endodontic procedure is understand anatomy. People Lower anteriors, I get, there's two canals half the time. And I'll do one in two canals, send it back, and they'll go, wow, oh, I've never seen one. It's just, a, under, do your, understand anatomy. Now with the use of CBCTs, combing commuter tomography, people are understanding, wow, that what Gettleman talked about, it's there, the MB2 is there all the time. I, if I do an upper molar and I don't find MB2, it's not because of what it's probably because I couldn't find, I missed it. I mean, now, you get away with some for a while because they're there about 95, 96% of the time, about half of that time they join. Type two canal configuration. Um, so it might work for a while, but eventually it's gonna fail. But it's, you need to understand anatomy. If you can do endodontic therapy, understand anatomy. 
The first thing we did when we were educating endoc therapy was what? We waxed canal systems on little plaster teeth. Remember that? Yeah. We waxed all the canals and we learned about accessory canals, aberrant canals, multiple canal systems. I understand canal anatomy. They don't. A lot of young people don't. So, so let's back up. So um, my job is asked the questions. They're commuting to work. And I know when you said that, a bunch of people said, what's the difference between pulpal diagnosis and paradicular? Okay. Diagnosis. Pulpal diagnosis is their, yeah. it, well, plain and simple. Reversible, irreversible, necrotic. Is the pulp vital? Is it inflamed reversibly or irreversibly? Is it necrotic? Okay, paradicular diagnosis, is it symptomatic? Pressure sensitivity, that type of thing. Is there a lesion, asymptomatic? Asymptomatic apical periodontitis. Is there a sinus tract, symptomatic? We, we kind of have got things into reversible, irreversible, necrotic, and symptomatic periodontitis. There's a whole chart, American Association. I go to the website, you can download it. Sinus tract used to cause suppurative apical periodontitis. It's just at this point. So there's one chart of all this? Yes. Uh, on the, on, can, if you want to put that on the thing, I'll get you a copy of that too. Yeah, can you, can you email me that? Because that? That, the terminology has changed, but you want to pull up on paradigmatic diagnosis. And all this stuff that we learned hyperemic, we don't use those terms anymore. It's reversible, irreversible, and is there a paradicular disease? Okay, a lesion that's asymptomatic is the asymptomatic apical periodontitis. Um, you remember the old chronic apical periodontitis? We had the term phoenix abscess, remember that? Yeah. Where we had the lesion, all of a sudden it flares. It's, you know, there's, but things are pretty simple, but there's a separate diagnosis, and if you get taken the board, they're going to want to know a pulpal and a paradigm diagnosis. I want to, I want to know. Um, I want to know. I will get you that chart from the age. And, and, and the only um, thing for the electricity, the pulp tester, the electrical pulp tester, that's is that only used to confirm a non-vital? Correct. It's not. It, it, and the one, the most common one used is the analytic technology goes zero to eighty. It is fifty. Who makes that? Analytic technology. Analytic, okay. That's probably the most common one used. There's another one that has the same brain in a different manufacturer. But anyways, if you, a molar's 50 and the contralateral adjacent molar is 30, it doesn't mean one's, it's, it's a yes or no thing. It's vital or it's not. But even, I mean, put an ice cube on it too. Put, put but, but what, I, what I want to, but I want to respond, positive, short, but what I want to do is um, you, you, um, you do everything methodical, you know, you're, you're, you're methodical. When you sit down and, 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 and someone sends you a tooth and says, look at number 30, what is your routine when someone sends you a molar? What, what do you always do? Uh, introduce myself, ask the patient, their you chief, what? introduce myself, ask the patient, their chief complaint. Okay. Because so that molar may need a root canal, but that's not why they're there. I'll do my do diagnosis. I'll do my thermal pulp vitality tests, and I'll do some paradicular tests, and th you know, cold, EPT. You do your paradicular test, percussion, palpation. I'll paradigmally probe every tooth, and I'll have my definitive diagnosis. Obviously, radiographic evaluation is a key part, but radiographs are not much more than a, a road map on things, and it's a two-dimensional road map. I'm taking many more CBCTs than I ever used to. Okay, but I, I want to just say what you said. You got to remember, because I've been in like a dozen dental schools in Africa. I think I've been in 18 just in um, India. I've been to the only dental school in Kathmandu, and you're talking way too fast. <laughs> so just, just repeat, just what you said. So you sit down in a molar, so you introduce yourself. Introduce myself, and I'll ask the patient their chief complaint. Is it every time I bite down, when I have something hot, when I have something cold, is it spontaneous pain? Is it when I wake up, when I lean up? You gotta start thinking about other things. Temperament, dividend issues, sinus issues. I'll ask them their chief complaint. And then what produces the pain? Then I'll try to reproduce it. So if they say it's diagnosis. sensitive to cold, then you'll go ice. If they say it's sensitive to hot. Hot water. I do not believe in gutta perch on a stick stuck, you know, stuck to a tooth and can just inject hot water and isolate with rubber dam to do the heat test with hot water. But, and I'll do the, the whole, everybody's going to get a thermal pulp vitality test and paradigma test, percussion palpation. You know, everybody's going to get pro, I, mean, I just to be consistent. I just yeah. be consistent with the diagnosis, but follow their chief complaint and go from there. Um, the chief complaint is cold. Do you have easy. do you have a uh, a cheat sheet on how many um, canals 
all 32 teeth would have if they are somewhere without a CBC teeth that we can um, attach to this? That'd be all copyrighted, wouldn't it? It's all by I the mean, book. And by the book. Um, by, it's all but, but, do, but do you have an Im is, is there like a one page sheet? That just says, I'm sure yeah. they could come up with one. Uh, but you, per, you know, it, it's percentages too. Like it. Right. And here you get a percentage yeah. of what can I, what roots and what teeth have what percentage there's um and, you know it's a type one type what do you, two, what do you, type three or type uh, four well, uh, regarding the cbct so well, um would you say the number one cause of a failed root canal is a missed canal yes or missed part of the canal so, words, they found so, the canal, but didn't do a good job of cleaning and shaping. So I guess where I'm going with this. So this part of canal. So if if the number one cause of a failed root canal is very likely to be a missed canal, some sort of missing that. If it's not a missed canal, missed portion of a canal, not properly cleaned and shaped, but missed, not thoroughly cleaning and shaping the canal system. Okay, um, but some but some people are thinking are starting to think that a CBCT is a lot of extra radiation than a PA. I think that's misinformed when you start talking to some of the guys that really done the studies and, and okay. know a lot about CBCTs. The average dental CBCT, we have a carriage from 8500, we have high resolution, small field of view, I'm not looking at the whole arch. And it's about the equivalent of four PAs, but gives me so much more information. Right. And I think the average CBCT for dentistry is in that range. Now, I'm not saying take a CBCT on everybody by any stretch of the imagination. Okay, well, that's our All frontiers have really consistent canal systems with very small variations. But if there's a concern, I won't do many retreatments without a CBCT because I want to see what's missed, why it's going, why that case failed. I won't do many paradigmatic surgeries without a CBCT because I want to see the anatomy in the whole area, not just the tooth, but the whole area regarding sinuses, uh, innervation. But there's... In general, I think that's that's a miscalculation. Just like everybody says that we have digital, it's six percent of the old fashioned. No, it's not. It's probably ten percent less. Six percent would be ninety four percent less. I don't think you're giving as little radiation with digital films as you are as you think you are. So, um, so the molars are uh, three fourteen. No, um, three fourteen. 19, First of all, it was 1930. And 30, uh, 31. But it, it's funny. What I was saying is, if you look at a, like 100 million insurance claims, um, you see these. Uh, basically, if you look at 100 million insurance claims, it doesn't matter if you run it for MOD, root canal, extraction. First molar. And, but it's just, it's just look, it looks like this heart has four pulses and it just beats on four first molars. So, so it makes sense. It's so, one of, first, one of the first permanent teeth in the mouth, tougher to keep clean than it. it most poorly taken care of tooth in the mouth is the, is the first molar in a young kid's mouth. And, 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 and when you see that, when you see that first molar erupt, you should like shit your pants. You're like, oh my god, seal. that's most likely to be killed, dead, extracted, replaced. Seal you the should seal that thing the Absolutely. instant you see it. That tooth doesn't have a chance. But it's what, I did, it's what I did to my kids, and you did to your kids, guaranteed. Correct? Yeah. Well, I, 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 that part of their life, I just kept trying to put them into foster care, <laughs> and everybody kept giving them back. And uh, but, uh, but so, so just so I, I really want to focus on first molars. Um, no other two. Probably the most common treated tooth. Not to mention also one of the most important tooth for arch integrity. Most important teeth for arch integrity. Don't you agree? Yeah. Many people can live without second molars. Right. You can live first molars. Right. I got, I got in trouble with one of my articles. I thought one of the best <laughs> monthly column. I've got a monthly column <coughs> every month since um, 1994. Can you believe that? March of 94. And so, you know, you'll run good stuff for years or two. But every four or five years, you know, you're going to, you're going to. You're gonna have your little moment where, uh, but um, I, I, I said one of the things I I'm didn't surprised understand. for you. It's that infrequent. Oh, I know. Uh, well, I have a good editorial team. They take out all the profanity. Uh, they have five dentists read it: Tom Giacobbe, Howard Goldstein, Tim Berg, Jason Lochtefeld. Who am I missing? And um, they have five dentists read it, arguing about um, who's all gonna get butt hurt over that deal, but. I, I was telling them that, um, you know, um, they're, everyone's afraid of second molar. I mean, I've been in several countries where they routinely pull the second molars. Um, they, they don't even think they're worth saving. Um, I, I, I said to my deal, I said, 
In my um, 30 years, I've never pulled a wisdom tooth that was an occlusion that someone came in and said they missed. And whenever it was the second molar, I'd always say, well, here's the deal. You know, you could save it or you could pull it. Um, you only chew about a sixth on the second molar, a third on the first molar, a third on the second bicuspid, and a sixth on the first bicuspid. I said, what I don't want you to do is put a couple thousand dollars into a root canal buildup and crown in a second molar when you got eight other cavities here and you haven't been in the dentist for three years because I'm going to max out your insurance and then you're going to come back for another root canal two years from now. And then another one, I said, maybe you should pull the second molar and put all that root canal crown money into your eight other fillings. I don't disagree with that. Oh yeah, well the people do. <laughs> and um, There are going to be a lot of people that disagree but do you, with do you, There's people that, and, and I can see the other side. Depends on the individual, I take it case by case. But if you're talking to somebody who's financially distressed and they have only so much money to go around and they have eight of, take care of that, you'll live okay without the second molar. If they win the lottery later on or they get a better job, they can always have an implant later date too. Implants are great. I don't do implants. I don't know a lot about implants. But, but I, I was saying in my column, I've only had one patient a decade, three in my whole life, that when they lost their second molar, came in and wanted it replaced with an implant and a crown. Only one time a decade. Whereas everything else, you see someone needing it every week. So when you see all the other procedures we do, someone wants I, it every week, it. your I whole life, it. and only once a day. Um, I, 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 I completely get it. Yeah. But, but so, so, back, so I, want, I want to focus our whole conversation always just on the, the six-year molars. Because like I say, when, once you've seen the, de the dental claims build on 100 million teeth on a graph, it, it makes, you would think. It makes sense. How many six-year-olds take care of their teeth? Yeah. You would think that it's only three or four teeth. If you look at all the insurance data. So, I, I, so on those four teeth though, um, the question I'm going with is, um, would you, do you take a CBC? What percent of molars, not retreats, molars come in your office, T number, you know, three, 14, 19, um, 30, 30, would do you take a CBC on before you? Initial you treatment, not retreatment, not surgery. Yeah. Just initial treatment. Small percent. But what's small mean? Single digits. Oh, so then it's not standard of care then? Not at this time. It may be retreatments and surgery. I'm taking one on everyone. And there's also the, the we're talking preoperative diagnostic. There's the other case. Let's say I'm working on an upper first molar and I'm having a hard time getting down or finding an MB2. I'll stop, take a CBC tent at that time to see how it is. So I will take an intraop. And there's occasions when you have a hard time finding a canal, even with the surgical microscope and everything. Um, so that there's, there's that that may up it a little bit, but that's not a big percent, but that ups it a little bit. And we, we myself, my partners, if it's a, we don't charge for intrap CBCTs if it's for us to help find the canal anatomy. Okay, I know what they say, because I, I, get, I get a lot of emails from every day, and, and one of the biggest things they um, want to know is um, when they go to the ADA convention, how many different file systems are there? Oh my Lord. I know, so they're all gonna, be, they're all gonna wanna know, what do you use? I use Tulsa. Tulsa. I use Tulsa system. Wait, wait, I use I, and I, I use the Blue Vortex series and I combine it with profile 0.06s and some small canals 0.04 profiles. I think Now the profile man, that's many an old people, file. I it's mean, an old file, but that, it's a radio landed. How long ago? 20 years ago? 94. 94. 94. That's when we started Dental Town magazine. That's when the profile came out. Um, and I still use some profiles and a lot of Blue Vortex. I use some Wave 1s. Um, I think most people use some sort of... And who makes the Wave 1? Tulsa. So these wave are all... Go, to, go. And, and tell them the, uh, Tulsa Dental Product is because um, Ben Johnson, who wasn't an endodontist, he graduated before endodontist. Before but he's even a specialist. Had a practice limited endodontist. Yeah, practice. When, when did endodontics become a prof, uh, one of the... Especially, I think it was 65. So at that time... But there was a lot of people grandfathered. Everyone who had a practice limited to endo was grandfathered in as a specialist? I believe so. I believe so. Now, that I don't use any one system solely. I use what I feel is best for that specific tooth. That, and I do a lot of muted systems. I'll do some profiles with the vortex. It's, and I think most people do have some sort of a muted system versus... Now, that's tough to understand. I mean, it, we'd be here all day if I told you what I did in each individual case. And the way they're sold, and they're, they work well as a system. But I like to do 
things my way and kind of use certain files together and you know muted one system with the other some wave one some do vortex with profile i still like profiles because they're a safe safe instrument um, safe meaning not going to break yeah and they say center really well because they have a flat rate of land there there's some things about that old file that i still like in in many cases um so the nice thing about Tulsa, they have many different systems not just one system and there's an old saying that you know, if you're gonna be obsolete obsolete yourself and they're always doing research and trying to and i, I don't work for tulsa i'm not i've never made one red cent from tulsa i just they're always listening to practitioners saying try this to some things don't work and 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 they'll try to obsolete themselves and get a bigger better a better file with better metal metallurgy tech you know as far as percentages and and i like that i like it kind of a a company that's sort of proactive versus just resting on their I think uh, Ben was such a pioneer in so many ways. So no ben, ben Johnson lived in Tulsa, Oklahoma, started Tulsa Dental Product, but he sold direct. Everyone else at that time sold to He said it was, it was a th one product company. It was Thermophil. Yeah. It was a one product company, and then he went from Thermophil. The but every Making them in his, in his own oven, wrapping the files that got a purchase. But every then single they went person. They went plastic, and now they've got a core, and they, so they've. You know, but every, every single person said, well, you're going to have to sell this to Shine and Patterson and Benko and Burkhardt. He said, no. And when he sold it to Densply, um, every one of Densply's divisions, Koch and all of them, sold to distributors. And he said, no, you're going you're gonna to stay dry. He wanted that one-on-one -on -one relationship. And I'll tell you what, um, your ears are burning. Every time that um, Tulsa Dental Rep, you know, when, when the Patterson, Shine, Benko, Burkhardt lady comes in, I mean... She sells 60,000 items and she doesn't use them. But when the Tulsa Dental Product Rep walks in, he could go to a whiteboard and draw every file system sold. And he could also tell me, because I would always ask him, every, every time I've ever seen him in my life, I'd always say, what, what, what does Gettleman use? And he would always know. I mean, he knew, he, he would tell me every single thing you bought. So I really like the detail rep as no opposed question. to the, uh, the general rep who says, here I can sell you sixty thousand items. Ben Ben was a real pioneer. Okay, Absolutely. so so um, I want to go to the true or false. So it seems like when they're on Facebook or Dental Town, they think, oh look at that root canal, it's perfect, and it's always because it's obturated real pretty. But if you find all the canals and you get to the bottom and you, and you obturate it real pretty, it, it's about that's about what sixty percent of the canal system infection. So you could make the prettiest root canal, but if you didn't use bleach, I mean, you could you could shape it and obturate it and make it gorgeous, but it's the bleach that kills about forty percent that you're not mechanically well, removing. Was that? Would you agree with you that? You have to chemo-mechanically treat the canal. You have to chemically and files just create shape and remove some tissue, but they don't do anything to get into the aberrant, the excessive canals, the isthmus aberrations in the canal, and all canals have. There are very few round canals. Take some teeth, clear them with you know methyl salicylate and a couple alcohol solutions or and look at all the different canal that it's unbelievable when you look at a clear tooth what it, they really look like um and you need the hypochlorite to get into all those little nooks and crannies within the canal system and clean it all the files do is create shape they get rid of some of the tissue be it vital or necrotic depending on the case but they create a path to let you obturate but you need to clean the canals and i think that's the problem with some of these systems that are one or two or three, five, boom, 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 you're done instrumenting the canal, you operate it, but you never clean the canal. It looks good on the radiograph, but it's going to be a failure. It's going to absolutely be a failure. I spend more time cleaning the canal than ever. Instrumenting the canal right now with some of these great techniques and instruments that are available is pretty easy to shape a canal. You've got to clean it. And so my thought is still the... the I, 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 want, I want to key on that because when, whenever you're lecturing in uh, China, Cambodia, um, Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines. The Asian dentists always throw the Americans under a bus. They always say this. They say, well, you know, Americans, they only irrigate with sodium hypochlorite. But we we go through four different, we do sodium hypochlorite, then we do Paradex, then we do, um, what's the uh, H2O2? Um, so, uh, hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide, and I think there's another one. There's bleach, hydrogen alcohol, peroxide. Alcohol, dry the canal before you. And alcohol, and they say, we, 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 do, we use all four. Americans, they're in a hurry. They only use... Um, I think a lot of people are in a hurry. What would you say to that? I would agree to a certain extent. 
but let's answer it scientifically as well. You, all this is all good. Now, chlorhexine is not going to really affect many of the bacteria within the canal system, but there's nothing negative about that. Hydrogen peroxide, kind of the same thing. Not, nothing real negative about it, but it doesn't gain a whole lot. But you're spending more time on cleaning, more power to them. I have no problem with that. You want your irrigant to do three things. Number one, you want it to be a lubricant for your file so you don't catch up and snag and break, right? Saline would be as equally effective as a lubricant as, as anything else, agreed? Mm -hmm. But so I don't have the chloride covers that, correct? You want it to dissolve tissue. It would be nice to dissolve little vital tissue, but mostly necrotic tissue, tough to dissolve vital, but sodium hypochlorite does that. You want it to be antibacterial. Well, sodium hypochlorite is very antibacterial. Sodium hypochlorite covers the whole gamut of what we want. The other thing is there's nothing really negative, but I have absolutely no problem with it. The fact they're focusing more on cleaning the canal, I like that. I like that a lot. The alcohol, all that's going to do is, before you dry it, and that's what we learned that in dental school. That's what we did at the final flush just kind of desiccates it and dries it so you can get it more well sealed. There's not going to be any sort of less fluid in there making you, your seal not as well. So I have no problem with that. And I actually you, like, I, I use alcohol at the end after so much before I... You, you like, just like, said sealant. Um, we, you and I were taught on Grossman cement. Mm -hmm. Remember that? Sure. 30 years ago. Um, now there's a whole new class of um, um, sealers, um, bioceramic sealers. Do you do... You, what, 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 so again, she's asking... What do you use for a sealer? I use Ross 801 Elite Grade, which is basically Grossman's formula. Ross what? 801 Elite Grade. It's a nice, it's a real elite grade. smooth Grossman's formula sealer, basically. And I have no problems with the other ones. Some of the, and I use bioceramics for perf repair, for retrofills. Bioceramics are great, very biocompatible, great stuff. But, and some of the glass on it, it's just retreating. I'm not crazy about a lot of people using those because retreatment is about 40% of my practice. We talked about it in the textbook here. And some of those things, there's not a solvent for it. And if you look at Grossman's original formula, or original properties of root canal filling materials, root canal sealers in this textbook, it'll talk about the ability to go in. Because I've had to retreat some of my own cases. You know, when it's surgically inoperable and it failed because of corona micro leakage, I want to retreat that. And I don't want to have something in it that I can't dissolve, I can't get out. And I think that's a negative with glass on them, or um, obviously ultrasonics, when you're going on a curve, it can be dangerous, you can straighten out. So I think that's an, a negative with some of the, and I love bioceramics for, perforation repairs, um, some resorption, retrofills, but I think for an orthroid obturation, I'd stay away from something that doesn't have a solvent. Growth transformers for sealers. So, so the bottom line is, um, right, right there. back to the insurance data, because you, you can't get, you couldn't get two dentists to agree that today's Saturday, okay? I mean, I, I've been watching Dental Town four hours a day since 1998. I mean, my God, I love, I just, and they're always amaze me because someone will show something, say something, do something obvious. And then the next time I post, you're like, wow, I mean, I just love the way a hundred dentists can look at something and no one sees the same thing. But, but, but you're, um, but when you, again, back to insurance data, hundred million claims. If a general dentist does the molar root canal, a first molar root canal in 60 months, five years, 10% are extracted. We're not talking about you and me deciding if it needs retreat, if it's failed, if it's not done right. Just regardless, it's, it's, it's freaking gone. And if the endodontist does the first molar, 5%. So endodontist at 60 months, 5% of those teeth are missing. And if a general dentist does the first year molar, 10% um, are missing. So obviously um, we have to do endo so that it could be retreated. I mean, maybe they never went to the final restoration. Maybe there, there's so many there's variables. So in many what was it yeah. a fra it, yeah, exactly. fracture? We can get on a yeah. whole success yeah. failure thing if you want. But, to, but, but it depends on is, why. The point is, you have to do a treatment based on the pos the real possibility that it could be retreated. And so you're saying bioceramics. You don't like the. the it's harder to retreat. It, it's a little bit harder to retreat them. A little bit or a lot harder. I haven't encountered a lot to make much of a statement. They're, they're used more for retrofills, perf repairs, but bioceramic sealers, I'm not sure I've encountered many yet. But that's that's the book on them, is there, but they'll, when prob you're they'll retreating probably come up with some molar, kind of solvent. They'll very well come up with a solvent for it. Do you think they will? I think there's a good chance. I mean, if, they're gonna, if you're gonna make a seal like that, it'd be nice to have a solvent, and they should be able to. There may be some that I'm not familiar with too, so let's, I'm so, not familiar when, with everything when, out there in the market. When you're retreating a molar, what, what's, what, what is, um, makes your life more difficult? when you're trying to pull out what the last guy put in. Some of the Sergeni paste that set up rock hard. And they don't still have use Sergeni? Yeah. In 2017? The, the only thing that makes my life real hard with 
Yes, there's still some of that out there. Or various paste, maybe it's not called search any, but a paste. Something that doesn't have a solvent. And some things you just... So you, you still, now, 2017, so I, you still think there's Sargenia? Or is this Sargenia was placed 10, 20 years ago? That's what we're dealing with. I'm, I'm retreating the case that were done years ago. I don't yeah. think there's much out there. There are probably some paste systems. But the most difficult thing that I deal with with re retrieving is something that's not soluble. I can't dissolve it. I just want to say one thing on the Sargenia deal. You know, your kids come out of school. You got an endo program. You got a board certified endodontist teaching all this stuff. And then you get out and you go take a job for some old man who's 60, 70 years old. He goes, I got a trick for you. They're too dumb at the dental school. Those who can't do, those who can't teach. And he pulls out a little jar of paste. And he says, I, I do my root canals in five minutes. And you think, damn, molar endo is hard. I hate it. This is really easy. But I'll tell you, 30 years is one of my very, very best and closest friends in all of dentistry um, believed that. It was Sargenti. And he was, oh, it was in the closet with it. And, um, and he um, spun some out the apex and he hit the inferior alveolar nerve. It's what and it what happened? It, and, and it pickled it. And it went to court. And they, he lost, and they took the maximum amount of the claim. So he had a, life, a disability, it was a million dollars. A million three. A, a million and three, it was three million lifetime, to be lifetime yeah. total. So he lost one million dollars, but I'll tell you this, he, he the, 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 the um, having the society rule, the board rule against him, the trial, the loss, the newspaper, he never smiled again. He didn't like dentistry again till the, the day he died. I mean, it was just a—it was just like a game changer. It's the same thing with same thing with an anesthesiologist. I've never done IV sedation because in every hospital in America, they don't let they don't let the cardiovascular surgeon do the IV in the surgery. In every hospital in America, they separate it, and you do the IV. And every dentist you've ever met that lost a patient under sedation, they're never happy again. No. I mean, how how can you? And, and but anyway, he was in. The, but anyway, it ruined his career. And just Sir Jenny, um, though, what, what would you say, guy? Those who can do, those who can't teach. Here's a little trick for you. Here's what I'd say about Sir Jenny, and we learned this. And, and maybe you remember this. Maybe you don't. Dr. Dale Anderson ran the endodontic department when we were in dental school. Remember, Dr. Anderson? Yeah. And that that came up. He said, for those of you that go out, the exact scenario you're painting. He said, some of you are going to go out to private practice. You're going to associate somebody. They're going to use Sir Jenny. He says, I'm going to teach you in one sentence what you need to know about Sir Jenny. You may remember this or not, but you'll probably appreciate it. He said, when you hear the, the word Sir Jenny related to endodontic therapy, what you should do is just turn the other way and spit. That's what Dr. Dale told us when we were probably sophomores in dental school and we were doing the preclinical pre endo lab. And you know what? Pretty well said. We I, had I don't to... think I can say it better myself. Ryan. We had to cancel a podcast yesterday because we wanted to podcast this dentist, and it would have been a great podcast. But when he sent in his talking notes, one of his talking notes was Pro Sargenti. So I emailed him and called him and said, okay, well, we, we're not going to talk about that. I'm not putting that on my program. And he goes, no, you are. This is dentistry uncensored. we got to tell these people the truth. And we, we canceled the show. Turn the other way and spit, Dr. Dale yeah. Anderson. May he rest in peace. Great line. Yeah. Can you disagree with that? Well, I mean, and, and, and then other people, I mean, the one thing you also got to remember in the United States of America is that there's 211,000 Americans who are alive with a dental license. 150,000 of them are general dentists who practice over 32 hours a week. 30,000 of them are specialists like Brad who do more than 32 hours a week. But there's one million attorneys. One million <laughs> attorneys. What's the chance... Your homies listening out there are going to run it, are going to have an attorney looking at one of their charts one day. You're, and like I said, I do some dental malpractice defense work um, as an expert witness. You don't have a leg to stand on if it's a certain case. You, you really don't. And, and we, we, we have right all, now. we've all missed canals. We talked about that. We've all overfilled. We've all underfilled. We've all missed. But Sir Jenny, just the principles and fundamentals of endodontic therapy, the standard of care is not Sir Jenny paste. And I don't think, like the individual you're talking about, who was miserable the rest of his life and he never smiled yeah. again. And the patient that had the surgeon and the inferior nerve may not have smiled real well again either. So there's two people from that surgeon in case that probably didn't smile a lot. Agreed? Yeah, and one night when I'm um, having dinner, um, this guy who lost a patient under IV sedation, um, he did the IV. Um, when he went to the bathroom, his wife told me at least every month 
since that happened years ago, he still wakes up in the middle of the night screaming. And it's like, and then when they take you to that jury and you do your own IV sedation, they're going to bring in a board certified anesthesiologist. What do you think the chance of some guy who learned IV sedation and a holiday in is going to take the cross examination of a board certified anesthesiologist on a witness stand? What would that look like? It would not good. I, I am very close with a board certified anesthesiologist that went to Yale. My wife. So um, you're sleeping with an anesthesiologist? Yeah, I guess so. It's, 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 it's not as impressive as it used to be. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's, uh, you know, it doesn't pull as much weight as it so used to. So your wife is a board certified anesthesiologist from Yale? Correct. Amazing. Yeah. And what what would what would she say to a general dentist who said I want to sign up? Well, what she would say to me? The holiday in course. What she would say to me it. first of all is that that I married up is what she would say to me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> she uh she would have issues with that. that well, 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 we'll ask her this. Maybe if she knows anybody to write an article, maybe she'll want to write an article. On, but you know what? Um, she's written chapters and textbooks on Pete Ashcraft. I don't. I don't. Um. I don't. You know, a lot of dentists complain to me when I um, say anything. Um, like, like, like on Dental Town, or some will post about the the dentist um, in uh, um, who um, in Toronto who was filming his staff go to the bathroom and got caught. And then, and then, and then people say, you know, why did you post that on Dental Town or social media? You're destroying the image. I said because. If there's two million dentists on earth and one idiot was doing that, the Somebody other idiot is. needs to know that if you get caught, look what happens. Just like, just like uh, I was on my way to Africa to shoot Cecil the lion's mom. Oh, really? But the story broke out, and I had the airplane turn around and come back. I mean, I realized that that was probably not a good idea. No, I'm just kidding. Wasn't but, that the dentist in, uh, in uh, Minnesota, Walter Minneapolis Palmer. That, that shot? Yeah, Walter Cecil. Palmer. And it wasn't even a, a hunt. It was. I know. It was like shooting fish in a barrel. The way it went about that. Hell, it had a collar on it. It had a. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's sick. But but the the that point. That was ridiculous. Yeah. The the point is, um. I still, am am asking people like your wife, how come we do every day in dentistry what's illegal in every hospital in America, and that is to administer the anesthesia while you do the surgeon. You're either the surgeon or the anesthesiologist until you leave the hospital, and then you go to the oral surgeon's office, and now he's both. And the um, a lot of countries are asking that question. The UK is obsessed with that question. Oh, really? Yeah, because they're looking at the mortality rates. And even though... A board-certified anesthesiologist like your wife might only maybe lose, say, one out of a million. The oral surgeons are losing, like, three out of a million. And even though it's a rare, rare, rare event, they're, they're still, people are just asking, why is this? And I'm going to throw my homies under another, another bus. Because I believe this. I believe a profession has to police itself. And once you start running it like a country club and everyone looks the other way, then you invite in the government. So my, my deal is, do you, do you want the people to run to Washington, D.C. and say the dentists have run amok and then step up regulation? Or do you want the police to so There has to be checks and balance. And I think looking at Dental Town since 1994, I mean, dentists are well capable of policing themselves. And one of the things that um, bothers me because I know my I know my dentists. I mean, I know my homies. They they give every uh, what I'll ask you. What percent of dentists after every molar root canal give them a pen VK and eighteen tabs of Vicodin? Way too many. But what would you guess though? What percent would you guess? What's uh, your gut feeling? I would probably say fifty or more. Yeah, yeah. And, and I would say every let's take, let's take it another step further. I get patients coming all the time with thermal sensitivity. It's vital, agreed? Yeah. That are on antibodies. What is that gonna do for a vital case? Well, here's what some now of we say. have Now here, we have here's MRSA, we have super bugs. Why? Because all the abuse and overuse of antibiotics and the bugs have mutated. Now we're gonna, you know, soon penicillin's gonna be like taking an M&M. &M. The overuse and abuse of antibiotics. Now granted, if you do the research, look at that, there's a, a large, large part of that's the veterinary industry cattle all that kind of stuff that is it really yeah it's a big big part of it bigger than than i thought until i read into it because i have a real issue with that 
for pull, the overuse and abuse of antibiotics are causing bugs that are going to kill us. And I almost, I don't know, I was in the hospital for four days in September with a staph infection. I nicked my elbow at the gym. And remember Dan Levitt? Absolutely. He's Dan, an Indian on us. Yeah, he's a, and, and in Missouri. One of my very best friends. Columbia? Columbia, correct. He and his wife, Kathy. Did I get it right? I got yeah, it. You're right Indian on us, Columbia? And, he and his wife, Kathy, and, and myself and my wife, Jody, were up in wine country in Napa for a little. Nice little vacation, and I woke up the second morning there with a swollen elbow that hurt, and it continued to increase about oh maybe a quarter inch every couple hours, and I ended up coming home and being in the hospital on IV vancomycin, IV zosin for three days, and not getting any better. It took me to the OR, put a drain in, I drained in for two weeks. I'm not thinking I was close to dying. I'm not saying I was close to Could losing my arm, but you know the. Antibiotics weren't working quite like they used to on these, the in these, but we don't, it's, why? Because overuse and abuse and bugs mutate. They're saying, that, and now we have stronger antibiotics, but the, the side effects, and I was septic. You talk about being sick nine months ago. So now, that being said, you cannot treat endodontic, be an endodontist or, or do endodontic therapy without the use of antibiotics, but I think they are overused. No question. But, but go over... Okay, if you did a hundred first molars, what percent of the time would you send them home with pen BK, 500 milligram, 28 tabs? When they're swollen, they have signs of infection. Uh, they're not feeling well. You know, they've got the malaise, they're feeling poor. When they have signs of infection, not just because I'm doing a root canal. When there's signs of infection. Remember? Yeah. Inflammation, infection, rhubarb galore. What do the Greeks call it? Um, swelling, r well, r red, rhubarb. Rhubarb, two more swelling. Two more larger. swelling. Calor, heat. Heat. Dolor, pain. Dolor, pain. The signs of inflammation. Now, inflammation doesn't always mean infection. Let's get that. But that's kind of a place to start. If they're, if they're infected, there's signs of infection, they're going on antibiotic. If there's not signs of infection, and periapical lesions, Chronic apical periodontitis, if, if, even if it's symptomatic, that's not signs of infection. And with infectious flare up, second or initiating root canal therapy, you're looking at probably five to eight percent chance of infectious flare up. So, on those asymptomatic lesions, when you open them, oxygen is in, the fact that they don't bacteria, they come back the next day, you say, What the hell did you do to me? Well, that, I always tell patients before I start those, there's a hundred percent chance you're going to be infected and swollen at some point. Now, you may outlive that day. Once we start, I've reduced that down to about five to eight percent, but it's probably going to happen next day or two. So I'm not going to, for five to eight percent, that means 92, 95 percent chance they're going to be a little sore. Maybe need some anti inflammatory. I'm not going to put antibiotics on for five to eight percent. If they need it, I will get them back in open drain. You get drainage, that's always the best thing. Anti inflammatories, different story. I use those regularly. I use a lot of anti inflammatories. Which one? Motrin 800 is kind of my go to. Four times a day? Three to four times a day, depending. Three to four times a day. Um, here's another one um, Dennis argue about. Some say you can only one-step a cario endo, but once you have a periapical radiolucency, the infection is out the bottom of the tooth and you cannot one-step it. No, then false. there's other people who one who said, I've one-stepped every single root canal I've ever done for my whole life. So when do you one-step, when do you two-step? A lot of variables. Vital cases, there's no reason to not do one appointment. Cases with sinus fractures, no reason not doing one appointment based on if I have time to do a good job. If I don't have time to do a good job, I'm not going to do it in one appointment. There's cases that I could do in one that I don't because of lack of time to, to do the quality job I want to do. If there's signs of infection, I do not, you know, the, the pus, swelling, drain, I won't do those in one appointment. Necrotic cases with an asymptomatic lesion, that's not necessarily infected. I'll do a lot of those in one. Um, some cases I'll dress with calcium hydroxide. That's one int the one intracanal medicament that I use is calcium hydroxide, and I think you'll find most endodontists will say that. Made we're, by who? We're, a lot of where, where, where do you, I mean, where do you buy yours from? Is that just I, Tulsa Dental? What their their calcium they hydroxide? Have cal they, yeah, there's all kinds. Of, you can get kinds like, of those little. Uh, I mean, they're used needle to tips. Age twenty six was that's a, that's an epoxy resin sealer for age twenty six. Is calcium hydroxide. Is you know you have a pH of 11, 11.2. It's a great antibacterial material. So I'll leave it in, sealed in, you know, seven to ten days. I say I'll leave it in for a couple weeks, have the case back to finish it. That's the only intracanal medicament. 
when we were in Dallasville, we were using former creosol, we were using crescent, creosol beech wood, all kinds of different stuff that the, the only intracanal medic and I use is calcium hydroxide, and that's when they're infected. You said a quote by our instructor, um, Dale Anderson. Dale Anderson, do you? I, the funniest thing I remember him ever saying one time, I don't know if you ever heard him say it, when they were talking about alteration, he said, if you find all the canals, you get it all cleaned out, you get all the, the organisms out, you could fill it with sterile bird shit. You know, they Did go, you ever hear him say that? Yeah, he said that. And I think that, that goes back to Dr. W.B. Hunter in Canada that was doing pulp caps with sparrow droppings. I think there's some literature on that. I think that's, I think that's where that comes from. I mean, when you, when you write a chapter in textbook, you read, you read a lot of articles, and there's a lot of throw, but you find some that are interesting. I think that was Dr. Hunter up in uh, Canada. At, I don't know if he taught at Dalhousie, Nova Scotia. I'm not 100% sure on that. But it was actually, the history of that was sparrow droppings for pulp cap back then, not obturating the problem is that's full of the but, but the, the but bottom line the is what he's saying is, is clean and shape the canal. Who cares what you fill it with? I agree. Right. I'm not going to don't, but got a perch of some sort. Right. Not sparrow droppings or bird crap. Um, another thing that um, confuses the dentist. Oh, number one. Um, does the media is bombarding um, everyone that um, when we were in, for most of our career, there were three thirty thousands, thirty thousand dying car wrecks, thirty thousand accidents, thirty thousand suicides. Now out of nowhere, we got a new thirty thousand, and it went all the way to forty-seven thousand opioid this overdose. Is an annual issue. Yeah, an annual issue. So America, during our thirty years of, of practicing dentistry, usually every year about thirty thousand people die in a car, thirty thousand die in an accident, like falling off a roof, thirty thousand died suicide. Now we got a new one that passed it, went like all the way to forty-seven thousand um, opioid addiction, oxycontin, Vicodin, heroin, all this stuff. Um, when we were little and got out of what school... What happened to Tiger Woods last week? Didn't get pulled over, but his, his blood alcohol was zero, but you know, he was, he was a, on a Vicodin and a couple other mixture of narcotics, I believe. A lion can't drink and drive, but a tiger would. <laughs> um, but the, so, so the question is, when we were little and got out of school, the, the, main, the main press was saying, look how mean the doctors are. She's got chemotherapy. She's got cancer. She's dying. She's in pain. These mean doctors won't give her pain med. And so doctors are like, okay, we should start giving them more, more pain med. And now the pendulum's clear over here, and they got this addiction issue. Do you, do you and you're think creating it. You're getting liable for, you get sued for becoming liable for creating the addiction as well. That's something you have to be careful of, too. That's, and that's I've something seen, new I've seen that, some doctor, good. And I've seen some doctors um, pay to put their dental assistant through the Betty Ford Center because she was stealing prescriptions from his office or calling in and ordering uh, bottles of um, hydrocodone. And then when she finally was full-blown addicted, she says, well, I've been stealing them from your dental office, ordering them on your deal, and then you have to pay for my rehab. That's wrong. But anyway, but my question is again, 100 molars. How many of those 100 molars are you given 16 tabs of Vicodin? Couple. Couple, single digit. And what percent of the dentists? I use very little narcotics. I use a lot of anti-inflammatories. I use very little antibiotics. And what's weird is when you look at when I look at the research, um, the research looks clear that when you rotate a Motrin and a Tylenol, that was that was that's the that's the highest on the chart. And, yeah, because your opiates well, are way down the list. And it's that seems to work the best. But even what I'll do post-surgery, severe pain, some of those cases that are really bad, I'll still alternate Motrin. With you know, I use Vicodin with Vicodin for you know breakthrough pain because the motion's going to cut down the inflammation there. The Vicodin's going to kind of tell the brain you're not in pain. And I was around not to drive, warm not to drive, drink alcohol, and I was taking the Vicodin. But you know, I'll do that for some you know lower second molar surgery, some tougher surgeries where I'm going through a lot of a bigger deal. Uh, but I don't you know, in some of the Vicodin, it's just because you get sick of arguing with you know you go through, you have these rolls of glasses, nobody's getting narcotics from me. But I get sick of arguing. I I can't take Motrin. I can't. I have the stomach issues. I can't take that. I can't take this. I can't take yeah. that. Then I take the Vicodin. At this point, you know, here's a Vicodin. I mean, I, I so you give me. Yeah, I don't give. I don't give more than a couple of days worth. And you know, I try to talk to him, but after 20 years, you get fatigued. You're just like, you know what. I'll give you eight. You're going to have to work real hard for more than that. The fact that we can't call it anymore, I think, has helped with that abuse, too. 
like the strongest stuff you can call in this town, all three. I want to, I want to ask you one more insurance data. When you look at the um, like 100 million insurance claims over like the last 20 years, why did the um, um, what is it? Um, why did the apicoectomy and retrofill? I mean, it's going the way of the dinosaurs. Implants. 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 Clearly. And is, and is that a good As, thing, bad thing? What, what, what do, you, do you do less than you did 30 years ago? I do less for treatments and less surgery than 28 years ago. I'm not as old as you. <laughs> <laughs> Simply because implants are good. And I think implants are wonderful. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying negative about implants. But the best implant is what? Is your tooth. From, from a proprioception, they have a ligament. From an emergence profile, from a contour, contact, occlusion, tooth is better. Now, if it's non-restorable, it's a different story. I think an apicoectomy and retreatment are, are very underused procedure. Sometimes it, it's not worth doing based on a proper diagnosis. Now with comb beams, we're better off diagnosed. We can do a better diagnosis. We can, you know, if it's an oh my God fracture, it's pretty easy to diagnose, you don't need a comb beam. But if you have that small fracture with that little tubular defect showing the bone loss, it, it make more hint that it's probably fracture, it's not worth doing the apico or the retreatment on. But if it's not fractured, fractured teeth have a might as well just but the prognosis is terrible and I and so I'd rather get rid of them sooner rather than later when there's a good amount of bone make an implant more predictable and try and be heroic do the endo do the retreatment do the yeah. surgery which I've done cases on those that were fractured and I probably shouldn't have before the use of the comb beam our diagnostic ability and then a year year and a half later there's less bone make an implant less predictable if it has a if the prognosis is terrible let's get rid of it now have the surgeon do the implant when there's a larger quantity of bone making the implant more predictable but if I feel the prognosis is good with retreatment and periodic surgery, I still do plenty of them, and I will continue to. I think it's a great procedure and very predictable, properly diagnosed and in the right hands. Okay, here, here's another. Makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Here, here's another confusing thing. So people write articles that um, this tooth died because it had a leaking crown, and um, but a lot of times you send that patient to the endodontist and they drill a hole to the crown. Well, if, if the crown is leaking, remember, I don't, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't make these questions up. <laughs> I mean, there's 5 million posts. The endo section is, by the way, the second most active no, section. No, this, this is a great point because we're going to get into chronal micro leakage okay. and I'll talk about okay. access filter. So she's thinking, this is, this so is, this she's is thinking, important, this so is important thinking, stuff. Well, Brad, if the tooth died because it leaked under the crown. I'm well, taking the drill. crown. I'm taking the crown off and removing all the carriers. I'm well, not. You good. are. Yeah. Oh, okay. Absolutely. So talk about that. Um, if if it failed because of some kind of recurrent decay around the existing restoration, I'm not going to go through. I'll take that restoration off and do. Yeah. You know, th let's. All right, I'm going to go off on my tangent here a little bit because you went off on yours. What's so my turn? Oh, okay. did I did I cut you off? No, no, no. Did I cut no, you off? but I'm going to cut you off now. Okay, great. We'll, we'll call it. <laughs> I'm one off. <laughs> you owe me a cut off. Going through a crown, which I do regularly. And trying to bond and seal and the, and the, the core, the access fill. We're not, we're not bonding the porcelain all that well. We're not bonding the dentin like we think we are. We can bond an enamel. We're not bonding the dent like we think we are. When you're going through a crown, there's no enamel there. You're bonding the dentin and some kind of metal or ceramic. Agreed? Right. How good are we bonding with that stuff? Well, I'm good because I would use amalgam because it would corrode a seal. You know, you're a, such an underused material. I would too, but it's like you're the antichrist if you use amalgam. <laughs> True. I know. I mean, I but know. amalgam is probably the best restoration in that place. But, but it's you're the antichrist if you use it. Isn't that funny no, how the no, guy no. who wrote a chapter in the most in the most popular book of the world said amalgam would have been the best restorative material, and you just can't get that. But you're the antichrist if you use it. I know. It. It's, uh, I know. No, so it's, number, it's but like number talking. one, the fact, and I don't. I'm not a restorative dentist. I don't have. A, but I, I'd rather do the root canal. But than the restoration, but the fact that if I do it, if I'm accessing through the crown and that cr tooth is never not under rubber dam, that's the best time to seal your gutta percha, without right. question. You don't worry about the temporary falling out, then missing appointment. Best time is right then when the tooth is never not under rubber dam. If I could convince every patient I treat through a crown to get a new crown, I'd have a higher success rate. Because we're not, coronal micro leakage causes more failure than apical leakage. When we're in Dentalsville, we learned the other way, apical leakage, apical leakage. Coronal microleakage is a much better problem in endodontic failure than ape leakage. There's no question about it. If you're, if you're a nerd like chance? me and you want all the literature, I'll, the I'll give you the references hey, Ryan, too. What, what's the chance a bacteria would come out of the bloodstream and go in the apex versus the saliva, which has a billion microorganisms, bacteria, and fungi? My point, my point. 
My yeah. point, exactly. You do a good job of cleaning shape the canal. The apical, that's not the problem. It's the crud. The mouth is the dirtiest place on earth. Well, no, the microbiologists tell me that um, the human mouth. It's disgusting. It, well, it, it has so much. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not making this up. Um, PhDs, they say you can't find a um, water in the Amazon rainforest. You couldn't find it in a the dung of a rhinoceros and all that no, because nothing has more nourishment than a human mouth i mean you're bathing it in carbohydrates and proteins and sugars they find more life per cc in a human mouth than any other place on earth absolutely it's filthy so which is to bring us to the next logical question that town is going to answer ask i'm sure you get this do you leave teeth open that has to be a question do you ever leave yeah, teeth open absolutely i mean that's a i hate leaving teeth open i'll leave them open for a couple hours under rubber dam continue to drain Sometimes it drain. you know, people say they don't drain more than 10 minutes. Well, I disagree. I've had many teeth drain more than that. I'll complete the instrumentation. I'll leave them open, but they're in a rubber down in my chair as long as I can leave them there. I'll say, I don't want to leave a tooth open overnight. Why? You, you left an open area into what? The dirtiest place on earth. Let's leave an open wound and let's put it, where do you want to put it? The dirtiest place on earth. That's a good service. I don't like doing it. Yeah. Okay. I'm now gonna, there's some cases that I've even went to the point with. You know what? I just I'm just going to flap it. I'm going to obturate this and do the surgery at the same time and get the drainage, get it cleared out. It's like when they finally treated my elbow, got so much better. We're we're into overtime. Can I keep you for? Can I keep you? Can we keep going, or do you need to? No, no, a little bit longer. Here's another big debate. Some people, um, we're talking molars. Some people say, well, you have to have a post to hold on the restorative buildup. And then other people say that the only function of a post is to fracture a root. It has no other purpose than fracturing a root. So let's be realistic. You have the, that's not the only reason. The only reason a post is to support tech is to support the superstructure. Okay. All the research shows you need an adequate ferrule. It was one and a half to two is the debate. I'd like to. You need an adequate ferrule. Explain what a ferrule is in case someone missed it. Quantity of two structure, regardless of the core buildup, post, whatever. Quantity of two structure, you need a couple millimeters. Some people say a millimeter and a half. I like to buckle and lingual. In approximately, if there's a tooth on either side, means this will not as big a deal. And we need retention form of at least five millimeters. That's kind of the, the gist. If you were to do so the beta ferrule, analysis. But the of ferrule all the should studies, be five millimeters? No. Retention form with the core. So I'm not yeah. talking about posts. I'm talking about from where the the margin of the crown is going to be up. You want a core of about five oh, okay, the millimeters core. to but have two of that has to be two structure. It has to be two structure. If that's the case, you probably don't need a post. Posts are overused and abused. Some cases to support the superstructure, you may need to put a post in. If they're if you're really pushing limits of ferrule, I'd probably put a post in. But a parallel sided, vented post like system something where not an active system a screw post i don't like many no tapes. screws and no screws and i don't like real tapered posts either but a passively cemented post you have name and brands if you have uh the pro post by tulsa you have pair pair post like system with the pro post the by tulsa pair post type of system pair post makes a good one they have pair post can you can you do your entire practice pretty much from tulsa dental supply Pretty much. Probably, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, here is... Well, let's, let's get back to that. Oh, okay, so so yeah. two mil... This is important. Because I've talked to dentists about a ferrule, and they go, what? Two millimeters. Some people say one and a half. Two millimeters of ferrule, buccal lingual, as long as there's a tooth, museum distal, and a five millimeter retention form. Posts are overused. Sometimes you need them to support that superstructure, but they do... How many... Fractured teeth, you see, they don't have posts on them. How many? I think most posts are pretty, cause a lot of the iatrogenic fractures. Now they so come and they have fracture down the mesial marginal ridge. You can't get a crown down to the eight percent of it. That's gonna continue to perpetuate as you continue to use the tooth and lower. So, so you're gonna lose that from fracture. That's not from a post, different story. But do, you, but do you think a lot of the fractures you see are from post? Yeah, because the longer, bigger they used to be real popular and we know that beyond six millimeters you don't the retention is zero percent doesn't help you out at all as far Once as the post is longer than six millimeters in the room it, it's not you're not gaining anything you're, not you're, gaining. you're getting in the danger zone but you agree that posts cause a lot of fractures they do Lo is, too long you, a post too big to a post too wide a post too long but but so, po so posts are i'll say this posts are way overused and abused 
Okay, but let's talk about. But in some cases, they're they're necessary. But I have to. Uh, I I mean, I know what's going on on the street because you know they 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 don't say it in the lecture. They probably won't say if you go to dinner with four couples. But you go sit at the bar with them and drink till three in the morning. They're all going to say the same thing. They're going to say, um, Brad, I'm in Tokyo, Tokyo, Paris, and London. The government dental insurance only gives you one hundred dollars U.S. for a molar. So a hundred dollars. In the United States, I used to get $1,000 for a molar root canal when we got out of school from Delta of Arizona. Now, 95% of the dentists are on a Delta PPO. 95%, 82% are on two PPOs or more. I think, um, I, and, then, and then two thirds of dentists are between like, on like four and 12 plans. So when we got out of school, the number one um, overhead cost was labor at 28%. Now labor is still 28% on average for dentists, but the number one cost that didn't show up on a statement of income, it's adjusted production. I bill a thousand for a uh, root canal, but Delta kicks it back to 600. So the average general dentist has a 42%, the number one overhead, 42% right, adjusted right. production write-off. So, so the post is a separate bill of procedure. When you're eating dinner, with dentists in Tokyo, Paris, and, and London, they say, Brad, they're only giving me $100. I have to put a post in every freaking canal. So if yeah, you're doing something for just for the money, that's not, you don't do things for money. Do well, things could for you do Could you do this root canal in Tokyo for $100 US? I mean, dude, we got the overhead of Phoenix. They're in Tokyo where land is a million dollars a square meter and they're going to give you one Benjamin for a molar root canal? I mean, your overhead... It's a, it's your, a, your overhead, it's a broken your, system. Yeah, it's a broken system because for you to do that, if your overhead was 10%, you'd do it at cost. Yeah. So so my, my question is this, and I know I know it's ugly. Uh, but you know, you that's wanna, the system when you start getting the socialized medicine and stuff. What are yeah. you gonna do? That, that's I mean. That, so here, so here's my so here's the, my brutal question. The people that suffer from that are the consumers. Yeah, who the who practitioners are who paid bought money. who paid eight hundred dollars of their own money for the new iPhone. Yeah, and bought a thirty thousand dollar Honda Accord in Tokyo. I mean, you walk down Tokyo, every restaurant is plush and bank and expensive the cars all look brand new and then when they go to dentist oh, well, i'm not giving you a penny i mean the government pays for dentistry and the government's you know broke they we we the united states has one gdp of debt so we have a 19 trillion dollars and we're 19 trillion debt japan has a four trillion dollar economy and they're eight trillion debt. so they have 200 percent gdp debt so the government's not going to give them any more money. So my, my question so is this. that problem is not fixable. So, but here's the ugly, brutal. I want to ask you the ugliest, brutalist question ever. If you had to place a post in every canal because your government insurance scheme doesn't even give you one third of the money necessary just to do the damn or canal, what post would you, what unnecessary post would you put in every canal? The smallest one I could. The smallest one you could. The smallest one I could. Because some of the technical questions they say like there's um, there's fiber post, there's metal post. Um, if you had to, the, the fiber you, post, I mean Denton has some inherent flexibility, and some of the fiber core posts flex like Denton. And so instead of you know when you get the real stiff posts, they're going to fracture the tooth, or maybe the post will fracture depending on the titanium. There's all those variables of the inherent elasticity of tooth structure versus post. So the one that that most, somebody sir that most matches that of the two so is probably the smartest one. Because when we're looking this, at, so, so we're looking at a maxillary molar, the, the big palatal root is very different than the little mesial buckle root. Correct. So what pose you would put, you put in the little mesial buckle? Oh, you'd be an idiot to put a pose in there. But the odds of doing that safely are minimal. You go down a millimeter or two, but what are you getting? What advantage is that besides your billing code? Something? A billing code in it's Tokyo, and Paris, and, and London. And that's it's, stupid. Well, tell the NHS that. <laughs> that that's, Didn't they just that's, get a new president or something? Or I mean, I would never put a post in a mesial buckler. Just, I mean, are you but crazy? It, that's but, that. And you're gaining nothing besides your bill on somebody, which is, as right. far as I'm concerned, but what is why the, you just what rob it, them? It's, e it's easier, quicker to <laughs> give them. Put a gun at their back their and after their wallet, it's more efficient. Yeah. You're doing the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's a, it's a, it's no it's a different. Weird, it's a weird it's, it's world. highway robbery, and it's no. more efficient. But what? But if you needed the post, what post system would you would you recommend? You said the. Uh, 
The Parapost. I like the any. The Parapost that are Tulsa. With it, they're all real simple. Any, that, that's pro post from Tulsa. Any parallel sided post with a vent. Is so why do you not fun. like tapered? Because I think a lot of them create some kind of, the potential for abuse and create an internal wedge inducing fracture is a better chance. Here, uh, now I'm going to add. Uh, uh, Makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the t less. But why not for tapered? Why not tapered? Why? Why do you keep saying parallel? I think there's less chance for abuse and internal wedging. Okay. It's not going to create the the. If you can, a small taper is not a big deal, but the larger taper, the more chance of wedging, thus inducing fracture with the occlusal load. Okay. Now. I know that. that's, here, that's here, here, known, I know it's hard to ask these questions when you're not seeing a patient, but. Um. I have two more questions. Two more questions. Um, number one, you have you have the insurance data that says the average MOD amalgam lasts thirty eight years. Now, an MOD amalgam. I have some health uh, that are probably close to that old. Yeah, it, it's it's half mercury, half silver, zinc, copper, and tin, and it corrodes to a seal. That's unbelievable. Then you have the insurance saying that the average posterior composite lasts six and a half years because composites shrink when you cure them and they leak. They leak like crazy. And but on Dental Town, there's this urban legend myth that endodontists love amalgams because they crack all the teeth and they need root canals. It's like, so does, does an amalgam last 38 years and then cracks the teeth and need a root canal? And is it true that a, a endodontists love amalgams because it cracks so many teeth? Because the insurance data is very clear that a posterior composite, six and a half years. It's gonna leak and that better chance that that's gonna create an endodontic issue than the amalgam. The proof was right there, number one. Now, so I'm, not, you, so, I'm not an endodontist that wants every tooth with gutta perch. I'd like every tooth to have a nice vital pulp in it. I'm not, I'm not looking for dental deterioration. I think amalgams are, are underused restorations. I think composites are overused. Composites are much more technique sensitive. Um, especially if you did a nice amalgam and you polish it like we did in dental school, they're probably well sealed and do, do a wonderful job. I, I'm not, I'm in favor of what's best for that too. And I would, love, I would love to take a picture of you talking because I understand the uh, whiter, brighter, sexier teeth for half the population that's a woman who gives a shit. Well, plus, so when you're talking about If you talk to somebody about molar. putting an amalgam in, you're, it's, it's, you're arguing with society. You're thinking, it's just, it's, yeah. which is stupid. Yeah. But it, it's the, re and you know what? It ain't changing. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I don't care how many people you get on Dental Town, how many people crazy, you podcast. That, that, that's the public wants what the public wants but even even and dentists are rational like i have dentist friends who have now like the whole time i've talked to you this whole time i have not seen anything behind your canines i have not even seen any sign that you've any bicuspids or molars in your mouth I do. at this I point do. yeah yeah but but i i have no evidence that so you're a boy they're afraid of dentistry they don't get a shot it's your own son he's six he has an occlusal cavity that six-year molar most likely be root canal pulled bridged implant everything and they put plastic occlusal that shrinks on their own son it's like this isn't about the consumer you're a doctor that, that's your that baby. bonds to that little bit of amal amal enamel oh. that's there it's not binded it's like, it's like, like we, you're like you, you're a think. doctor. You went to eight years of college. It's your own baby. It's a boy. I it's a maxillary molar, and you just chose a shrinking plastic filling. Your own son. At this point, what what would that person have to do to just prove you that screw science, screw logic? I'm just a talking monkey with clothes on. And I'm a evidence based guy. I want to see the science. Yeah. I, I don't, okay. So here here's so so you agree. That, am that composites cause more endodontic therapy than amalgams. No question, they leak like crazy. Yeah, no, no question. Yet, yeah, but you know how many dentists on, and th this, this is how the human mind works. You, t you show the data of 100 million claims. You go, yeah, well, none of those guys did it right. I do it better. I'm, I'm, I'm all that in a bag of chips. And you're like, no, well, no, dude, you're not all that in a bag of chips. I mean, you know, so the, so the, they're always, their brain's going to reset. Well, well, I do it the right way. You know, all my colleagues who have eight e years of college. You yeah. go. So here's the last question, which is so tough for you to answer because you didn't see the patient, but they do it all the time on Dental Town. They take out this amalgam. Put it in the closet. And there's a black line. And it, it always, they always take a picture and they stop and they go, so is this fractured? Do I now go to extraction implant? What do you do 
When you take out an MOD amalgam and there's a black line, how do you how do you wrap your mind around cracks? If it probes, I'd be a lot more concerned than if it doesn't probe. Explain that. Probe what? If it, if there's a six, if you're going around the tooth and you're probing, and not a six point probing, endo I do like a twenty point probing, and I'm going three 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 eight three three. I'd take the tooth out. If you're probing along, you're going, you know, three, three, two, two, three, three, two, two, right in line with it. There's no, I wouldn't be that concerned about it. You know, if it's just a black line, is it a crack? Is it just a black line? You're Obviously, you're thinking crack is where you're going with this. Um, I may take a CBCT to see if there's any bone loss associated with that, that I couldn't probe. Sometimes you can't get it in approximately you want to. Um, I'd be a little more concerned about that if I'm doing, you know, obviously for me, I'm probably going into the pulp. If I'm accessing the pulp and that crack, that black line goes down all across the floor, take the tooth out. If it doesn't, if it's you're just a superficial about, you're, you're crack. You're talking about a crack. That goes um, into the chamber. In the, and on down the, floor the floor of the chamber. The, yeah. I was talking about a crack when you take out the amalgam above the chamber, a black line. Yeah, if there's, if there's a pocket associated with that, I'd be more So concerned. if there's a black again, line I'm not, I'm not, above the chamber. You're, you're asking me to put myself in a scenario that I don't do. I'm not just taking out amalgam and putting in composites. They're in. If I'm taking out amalgam, there's a reason I'm taking out the amalgam. There's some sort of pulpal issue or something like that. Yeah. If it's just a cracked tooth, a leaky filling, a reversible pulpitis, I'm sending it back to you and you're doing it. But if I'm dealing with a situation where there's a crack and I'm taking out the amalgam to evaluate the extent, I'm going to evaluate the extent of the crack, I wouldn't mind getting rid of it. I'd go in down until there's no crack evident, quote, ramp out the crack, so to speak because it's going to perpetuate. You continue to use that tooth, which you're going to, it will continue to perpetuate and work its way down. You'll probably lose the tooth. I mean, just to show them, if you have the crack and you can get the crown margin below it, you're probably going to be fine for a very long time. If you can't, you're not doing a patient much of a service. I'd probably get rid of that time and go with the implant because there's good bone at that time. If you wait too long, it's silly heroic. There won't be good bone for that in a month, two months, 18 months, whatever. It's just a matter of time. It's not if, it's when. I'd get rid of the crack. If it definitely is a crack, if it's a little stained dent, I mean, which way, there's stained dent, there's little black areas that aren't cracks too, that we've all seen and we, we get all concerned. Hey, last, you know, last and part in fracture there. versus crack too, is it extending or is it just yeah. a little crazy line? A big deal about those. I hope um, we can get, I hope, you think Ben will let us put that video on the end of this? I think he would. Um, and another thing, I, I want to say something that's, um, um, get your thoughts on this, you know, right now, Everybody's saying, you know, the millennials are different, like like they're a different species and all this, and they don't want to own their own office, and they all want to work for corporate, and they all want to have a job their life. Do you remember when we were little, when we, 30 years ago when we were in school, do you remember how they told us the girls were only going to practice like five years, they're all going to get married? Yeah, family, yeah, 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 yeah. And, all that stuff. and look back at the girls, were, Stephanie Carmada, Dee Dee Richards, um, Lisa Gonzalez. Lisa Gonzalez. They, they're they still practicing with some of the biggest, Wheezy. most successful. How about Wheezy? You talk to her? Wheezy. Louise Gilmore. Oh, in St. Louis. My, my partner. I, don't, I haven't And Lori her. Engelman. I mean, I mean, so. I thought I Becky Sissel regular. She's teaching at Midwestern. Yeah, and, and I remember when they were saying that, I could see the girls' nostrils flaring. Like, <laughs> I wish that idiot man would shut up and get out of here. But wouldn't you say, wouldn't you almost say, I mean, we don't have data, but. Don't you think the girls in our class were just as long and had just as big or bigger, more successful dental offices the ones that I can than think the of, average yeah. male? I mean, I Be mean, Becky practiced for 26 years. Stephanie just sold her practice recently. She practiced for what? I think Stephanie 29? had the largest practice of anybody I know. I mean, Lisa's she, she still was practicing. crushing it. Lori Engelman's still practicing. I know. Them, so. Lisa so Gonzalez. What do, you mean, what do you mean we don't have the data? There's data right there. Everyone, we can, everyone you can name is still practicing that we can think of. I mean, with their, I, mean, I, I think in our, I think our class that's data. I, that's I, accurate data. Yeah, I think the average girl in our class had a bigger practice and practiced longer than the average man in our class. They, a lot of them still are. I mean, it, it's yeah. And that, that's data. That's accurate data. That's it's there. Yeah. Now it's class of '87 UMKC, but it's that it's data. Yeah. So, so do you believe that the um, the millennials now that come out of school? Or a different species, and they just oh, wanted God. to be an employee and work at a corporate I hear, in corporate, I hear that. I don't know why. But I, you believe it, though. That's what they're promoting. That's, that's, that's all I hear. I'm not in the academic environment at this point. I probably will be eventually. But I hear that's what they're promoting in dental schools. I hear that's what a lot of kids want. I, I, that's, I hear it. So the reason, I call, the reason I call bullshit is because we're a 
two million year old species that a hundred billion humans have lived. And for two million years, no human wants to live in your cave. They want their own cave. They don't want to live under your thumb. They want to do what they want. They don't like curfews. They don't like checks and balances. They don't like transparency. And now all of a sudden, what the species, what is it no longer homo sapien? It's like homo sapien millennial, like like they evolved. It's, it's different. But you say you disagree or call them bullshit. Oh, yeah, but you're I, not calling bullshit. That's what they want because that's what they're all saying. They're all talking like that. They're wrong. I call it from that aspect. I think they're mistaken. But you're not saying that that's not what they're, they're wanting or they're there because that's what they're all saying. You agree? Yeah. I mean, you're calling bullshit that they're not going to be happy. Not that that's what they're being taught or they're... I think what, they're being brainwashed. Yeah. They have the, too the, much debt. They, and be, because all those big corporations are in their schools giving them the Kool-Aid. I mean, if you're graduating right now from Dunnellsville, you're $400,000 in debt. Oh, my Lord. That's, and that scares me from a lot of different reasons. Corporate dentistry, I think you're going to find some people over-treating a lot of people just to pay their debt. That scares the hell out of me. Um, and I've seen some of that. Uh, I can solve the student loan crisis in one minute. How's that? Well, I've lectured in um, 50 countries. I would just graduate and move to Sydney. Oh, really? For, for half a million dollars when I leave America and go to Sydney, Australia? Hell yeah. <laughs> I just I just leave the country. Say, good, good. Thanks, thanks for the half million. See ya. Yeah, I mean, hell, half million dollars to move to Sydney? I'd move there for 50000 <laughs> <laughs> But hey, Brad, um, um, thanks for all you do. Thanks for all the uh, retreats you've done of mine over the last three decades. <laughs> um, you even did a root canal on the other endodontic legend, Joe Dovkin. I mean, you're an endodontist lecturer, and when you um, lecture... May you rest in peace. You didn't even really lecture general dentists. You lectured other endodontists. I don't do much of it anymore, but I've, I've I know. But you, dude, you're a legend. You, you no, no, you're no, the no. endodontist who. I'm just a and guy. And I want to tell you another thing. I'm just a guy I in Glendale that does root canals. I'm just it's, a guy in Glendale, Arizona, that's does root canals. Because when no, that's not, that's, I talk to my endodontist friends, um, and I say, "Well, what if you can't do the root canal?" And I can name you two right now. I don't know if they want me to say their names, but I will if you want me to. No, don't um, know, no, don't know. And they say, well, I, I sent it to Gettleman. Uh, I mean, I'm just a guy in Glendale that does root canals. Dude, do endodontists I'm... send you root canals in the valley? No, no, never. Oh, God, I can name two right now. Um, but anyway, I just want to say that I think you're uh, amazing. Well, thank you. Um, to be asked to write a chapter in the number one selling root canal book and most translated book of all time. Amazing. Um, I just think you're all that well, and two bags of do. chips. Thanks for all you do. Hey. And, but it would, it would, it would it's just be. Just like going back to Dr. Redbirds having a beer after finals. Oh my God. It would be the most amazing thing if you ever built this an online course on no And I'll tell you why, Brad. I know how I can get you to do it. We only charge 18 bucks for that course in ritual American Canada and all that. But when you go to dental schools in Africa and Kathmandu and all that, they're all free. And I've walked into dental schools where the dean, when she finds out that I'm the dental town guy, they burst out bawling because they can't afford these books. It's all on the internet. And so many of those dental schools, the instruction is a Samsung and it's YouTube videos. And and you know, then that, that I'm not knocking that. I mean, the YouTube video is a hell of a lot better than a 20 year old. I remember when I went into Kathmandu, all their textbooks were were donated. Half of them were donated from China. There were 25-year-old books written in Mandarin Chinese. The other half were donated from France. No one in the school could speak Mandarin or French. So they're just paperweights. So they just looked at the pictures. <laughs> and then Dental Town comes out. Now they got 411 courses. And that, that lady in Kathmandu, I mean, she held me and she cried. And, and same thing in so, many schools. Thank you for what you so, do. So for when, the you, world of when you do uh, an online C course um, on Dental Town, you'll be educating girls how to do endo that can't afford your textbook on Amazon. So I'm trying to guilt you into uh, this. I'm you're trying doing to, a good job. I'm doing a good job. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> but again, thank you. Last final question. If you had to go back in dental school and marry one of the girls in our class, which one would it have been? And we're not editing this out. We're not editing this out? Oh, hell no. Mary Kay Wilkinson? Mary Kay Wilson? Or, or Sigrid? Sigrid Simonson? Or Lisa? 
I would have become <laughs> I would have become a Mormon and married all of them. I was gonna say I'm sorry, because Lisa Gonzalez, <laughs> you gotta love Lisa. Dee Dee Richards, I mean, Lisa uh, Gonzalez, Stephanie. Stephanie, how can you pass up Stephanie? My God, that was on. that was a great class. Um, there's, a great there's, class. there's a, I could just go down the list. There was a t- and and there's there was another. You a, know, but that the African American girl is beautiful. From St. Louis. Um, what was her name? Yeah. Um, you know what I'm talking about. Oh, absolutely. She was stunning. We had a, oh, we had some look. Oh, but I'm not kidding when I say this. I'd, I'd marry them all. I'd, I'd marry them all. In every dental school I've ever been to, I always make a point to tell the, the guys, don't ever graduate from dental school without marrying one of the chicks in the class. And I kid you not. I mean, it's a different woman who got a four-year undergraduate degree, got into dental school, became a doctor of dental surgery. I'll, I'll, I stick, mean, I'll stick with my, I like my wife. But, but your wife's an she, anesthesiologist. Same thing. Same thing. I mean, I mean, it's we did different have, we did because some, what what do men? We had most some lookers of, in our class. But what do the them. men usually do in dental school? The women always marry someone intelligent. The men always marry the best looking waitress at the Waffle House. And uh, <laughs> and it's just a uh, it's just a huge mistake. Funny. Yeah. Okay. Funny. Thanks again, Brad, for all you do. Thanks for all you do.